Hello, everyone. Before we begin today's lesson, I want to thank you once again. And I know I often thank you, but because you have no idea how blessed I, I truly feel to have the audience of young people that I have. I never would have imagined, I keep saying that over, we're, we're nearly at 40,000 subscribers now, and we're growing. And praise God for that. But I wanted to thank you all because specifically today, because of I was reminded that ours is no mere pastime of idle abstraction. We really have a custodianship, a I believe on this channel we have we have been fostering a brotherhood of sorts. Because we we traffic not in opinion, but in truth. And I'm talking about capital T truth, mind you, the kind that stands firm while empires crumble and fashions change. Mathematics is forever. And we are, if I may be so bold, the last men and women, if you are a woman watching, but I'm going by the uh, audience uh, retention statistics that I have, and most, most are male mathematicians, uh, the, last, so the last men of rigor. And, it, and we're living in a world that's completely gone mad. And in mathematics, unlike politics or poetry, you cannot charm a theorem into being. You cannot seduce a proof with rhetoric. The truth either is or it is not. And thus, we stand together. We are bound by honor and logic. And we are sworn to call out error wherever it lurks, whether in the margins of a careless, carelessly written paper, or if you are still in college, I hope, and you are one of my favorites, by the way, the college students. But I hope that you are ruthlessly calling out error in your classmates and that you take it as a point of honor to do so when they write something brash or error laden. You are to take them to task. And our history, by the way, is rich. Our history, meaning mathematician history, we, we really are, it's rich with spirited quarrel and gentlemanly correction. Because among us, error is no trivial matter. It is an attack against the divine symmetry of the universe. And I was reminded exactly of that fact this morning as I took my usual stroll in the woods near me with my walking stick. And suddenly I remembered a famous incident at the University of Virginia, UVA, not too far from me, up in Charlottesville, about an hour away from me. And I am referring, of course, to the famous professor, the formidable professor, although he had a short-lived uh, time in the U.S., uh, he was a foreigner, James Joseph Sylvester. Now, he was not a perfect man. He was a Jew. He was not a Christian. Uh, he didn't believe in Christ. But at least he was very loyal to his faith. We can say that. He was, he was openly uh, Jewish in a time when America was overwhelmingly a Christian uh, nation. And no, not in the Constitution, of course, but uh, as a people, our, our ancestors were very much Christian. The vast majority of Americans would identify with the Christian church. Uh, in, back in the 1840s, whether it be, and mostly, we were mostly Protestants, by the way, we were, whether you'd be Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Anglican, Episcopalian, Church of England, whatever it was, uh, there was that. But let me give you some history about that, because a lot of you do not know history, you're not taught real history, you're taught fake propaganda these days. But back in the 1800s, UVA was, one, well, UVA was founded by Thomas Jefferson in the early 19th century. And it was one of the, I think it was the only university in America at the time that was actually non-confessional. It was not a Christian. All the other foundational universities in this country were Christian, whether it be uh, Princeton, whether it be Harvard, whether it be Yale. Uh, Columbia University famously was Anglican. Not so today, of course. Today's an, they are all apostate universities. They were taken over in the 20th century by the enemies of God. And, the, and, by the, and I would add the enemies of America, I would add, as we see today. But going back to the Sylvester incident uh, and UVA, UVA at the time attracted, because it was uh, not a, a Christian school, you had a lot of bad characters. You had a lot of gentlemen, too. 
uh, it was mostly these the sons of the the scions of the uh, the plantation owners, and they were there was a code of conduct. There was uh, there was gentlemen. There were there there were expectations as to what a gentleman, how a gentleman should behave back in those days. But this incident was a student had come to class drunk. It was not that unusual at UVA at the time. Some of you think that the past was everybody was prim and proper, and that's not the case. But the, the difference between back in the 19th century and today is that dishonorable conduct was not elevated to that of a virtue. It was severely punished, swiftly punished with violence. And unlike today, where bad actors are referred to as activists and glorified in that way, back then you were really called out for bad behavior. So you had a student in the classroom. He was reading the newspaper. He was insolent. And when Professor Sylvester called him out, the student bludgeoned him. So, of course, Sylvester drew out his sword cane. Yes, sword cane. If you don't know what it is, it's, it's literally a cane that can hold a sword. I have one, but I don't want to show it on the channel because I don't know if YouTube has strange policies. They might call me out for violence. So I'm not going to do it on the channel. I have a lot of weapons, but I, I never show you because if I did... I'd probably get into some kind of trouble with YouTube. And I always respect a, a platform. You know, that's, those are the rules as far as I'm aware. But he drew out the sword cane and he struck the young man down in a flash of academic justice, perhaps. But, but pro the professor believed he had killed the student. But the student survived and the university did not take appropriate disciplinary action against the student. Sounds familiar, right? So the professor promptly resigned in protest when the university failed to, to properly discipline the lad. And that's just one example of how mathematicians back in the day didn't take any nonsense, didn't put up with it. And let it be known, I wanted to be very clear about this. We are not, as mathematicians, specifically violent men. But for the defense of truth, we have drawn steel before. And I don't put it past any of us that we could do so again, should the occasion require it. And so we check one another relentlessly, intractably. We police one another. I love that. Again, not out of malice, but because we love being right. And I feel very blessed because I have a lot of young people on this channel who not only do you uh, hold me accountable, but you also hold yourselves accountable. And uh, we've we've been look, we've been seeing that in recent. I, I've I've really enjoyed the collaboration we've been having and calling out the the apostates, the scammers out there that are not true mathematicians. We need to call them out, and we will. I will continue to do so on this channel whenever it whenever it is relevant. So in this spirit, we now turn to another of the great axioms undergirding our house of truth: the Archimedean property of the real numbers. I'm going to give you two perspectives. One of them, you'll see a nugget from my book, from my upcoming book. And the other one is just sort of from my general notes, my undergraduate notes, because as I told you before, I've saved all my papers. All my life, I've saved all my academic papers. So a uh, big thank you to everyone. We're, we're nearly at 40,000 subscribers. Praise God. And we will continue to grow because we are defending truth. And this is the only channel, by the way, that where we're actually covering topics in great rigorous detail. Uh, I know there's a few other channels out there, and I've mentioned them before uh, in the comments. Uh, people have asked me about some of them, and uh, there there are good channels out there. And and you've seen I've praised some of you who have you know who do have a channel. You know who you are. Uh, so I'm not saying I'm the only channel, but uh, we can work together uh, as mathematicians from different points of view, but focusing on the main thing, which is rigor and truth. So let's get to work. All right. So we have to take a moment to remind ourselves that the when we're, when we're discussing, when we're dealing with the Archimedean property of the real numbers, we have to remind ourselves that the set of natural numbers, and as you all know, is that proud succession of ever-growing uh, integers, is not, not bounded above in the real numbers. And this ought to be clear to any reasonably thoughtful being. But 
we require formality. We have to satisfy our axioms. So we have to give a rigorous proof. And we have to rest firmly upon, uh, we, we've discussed that before, one of the crown jewels of the real number system, the least upper bound axiom. Or you could call it, of course, the supremum axiom. Since least, I don't know, that the, the word least has always had a faintly, I don't know, a faintly mass democracy odor. I don't like it. So I prefer to call it the supremum. But I, I like that. That's a more common word anyway in math. Um, but what is the Archimedean property of the real numbers? Well, you see it here on the board. Now, we have to consider here the, the set of all positive integer multiples of x. And as we can see, this, the set here is clearly non-empty. I mean, even a physicist could see that. Suppose, it, for the sake of contradiction, of course, let us say that y is an upper bound of a. Then, by the supremum axiom, the set, we would say the set A possesses at least a least upper bound. And we could call that Z equals the sup A. And I don't mean the sup you get on the street, of course. But how would we uh, imply that? Well, how would we show that? Well, N plus 1, let's see if I can write it out. So if we think of n plus 1 as an element of the natural numbers, then by that, whenever n, right, the value of n is a, an element of the natural numbers, it would follow from that that n plus 1 times x is less than or equal to, to z. And by that, then we have the following, uh, we can conclude that n is an element of the natural numbers. And remember, we use that symbol, the upside down a, that you saw in the, uh, in the logic series, right? You should, be, no, you should be familiar with those symbols. But what does that imply? Well, from distribution here, nx is going to be less than or equal to z minus x. And of course, for all the uh, nat the numbers are elements of the natural numbers. Sorry for my ends there. I just I'm not good with the the, the drawing. Um, but if you think of it as z minus x, well that has to be less than z, right? And that would be an upper bound also of a. So it would contradict the very definition of z as the least upper bound. And so we say that a cannot be bounded above. And remember, when you're writing a proof, we can either use a rectangular box or I prefer to use QED in Latin. Quod est demonstratum. This has been demonstrated. Now, if we... Think of it from a, from a different perspective, and another proof of this. Let's have a look. All right, so this is another perspective from my book. This would have been Proposition 12, and you can read it here. Given any cut alpha and any positive real number R, then there exists PQ, such that P is an element of alpha, Q is an element of alpha prime, Q minus P equals R, and Q is not the smallest number of alpha prime. If such a smallest number exists, that is, Q is a proper upper number of alpha. So here's the little the proof uh, in my book. You choose an S in alpha and a T in alpha prime, then T minus S is greater than zero and R is greater than zero. And so that by the Archimedean property of rational numbers, there is a positive integer n such that nr 
is greater than t minus s. That is, t is less than s plus n times r. And hence, s plus nr is an element of alpha prime, and there is a unique positive integer, m is less than or equal to n, such that, and I'll leave, I'll leave this up here for, the, for you, uh, quote est demonstratum. And then I wrote a remark right after this proof, and the remark says, in the foregoing proof, we used the Archimedean property of rational numbers, which reads, if A and B are positive rational numbers, then there exists a natural number N such that N times A is greater than B. This property is, of course, equivalent to the property. If R is a positive rational number, then there exists a natural number N such that N is greater than R. Since R can be viewed as a ratio of two positive integers, say P divided by Q, P over Q, the inequality N is greater than R amounts to NQ is greater than P. But the Archimedean property clearly holds for positive integers. In fact, if P and Q are positive integers, then PQ is greater than or equal to both P and Q. Thank you all. I hope this was helpful, giving you some more perspectives on my book. And if it was helpful to you, I urge you to continue to subscribe because more content will be coming out. I've been doing, I've been working very hard for you all. You all deserve it. Uh, and thank you all for the support that you show this channel.